Uh, my name is Amy Stepanovich. I am U.S. Policy Manager and Global Policy Counsel at Access Now, which is an international um, organization uh, working at the intersection of human rights and tech. Um, my friend over here will introduce himself. I'm Harley Geiger, and I'm Director of Public Policy at Rapid7. Rapid7 is a cybersecurity firm based in Boston. Um, we have offices all over, and we work on, among other things, uh, IoT security. We also have a, a very active research arm, which is dedicated to finding flaws in software, IoT, and otherwise, and bringing them to light. I run our public policy and government affairs activities. So we're here today to talk to you a bit about um, the Internet of Things and the legal, statutory, regulatory environment um, in that space right now and talk to you about what's happening in D.C. and um, at the state level just a little bit. Uh, the reason that D.C. finally, I think, started paying attention to the Internet of Things has a lot to do with the statistic from Intel, which um, lawmakers have seen of a lot, um, and that's that there will be 200 billion Internet of Things devices in the world by 2020. Um, to give you a little bit of math, that's 200 billion divided by the expected population in 2020 um, is about 25.6 devices per person. Um, and it's probably a lot higher than that given that only about 50% of the world is connected to the internet. Um, so it's, it will be very connected, according to people in DC. We'll be um, having a lot of our activities tracked. Um, a lot of our devices in our home are going to have some sort of connectivity functionality. Um, and so they weren't really sure um, what they could expect. People in Congress, if you, if you haven't heard, um, don't always, some of them do, but don't always have a ton of technical expertise. And so they were trying to figure out, in this new world, what needs to be done. Um, so there are a lot of unanswered questions um, in the IoT space. Who owns the device? Who owns the data? Who can collect data about me? For what reasons? Can we protect it all? These are questions that I think people in DC are really starting to figure out and delve into. Um, and the answers are going to guide any um, additional regulation or legislation that we see. Um, however, we want these answers to, to turn out. Um, so to start the actual educational portion of the talk, um, we wanted to, to take a step back and say, what is the Internet of Things? Um, we've seen a progression of computing devices um, over the last few decades, um, moving from very large computers through to smartphones that we carry on our bodies um, all the time, essentially, sleep next to, all the way down to our smartwatches, smart toasters. Toasters are a really big thing that we talk about in DC. Every time you talk about the Internet of Things, it's a toaster. I, we're going to use that a lot. I'm really sorry. Um, so why do we think of Internet of Things items differently than computers, Harley? Why we think of them as different than computers? Um, I would say that we don't know how to classify them very well yet. There is a great deal of uh, uh, inconsistency in defining IoT. And one of the problems is uh, if you try to define it, it, you end up sweeping in a ton of devices that uh, people don't necessarily think of as IoT. Um, at Rapid7, we take a pretty broad view and just define IoT with three general characteristics. Uh, it's a physical object that has uh, some sort of embedded technology like CPU, memory software, it's got internet connectivity, number two, and number three, some sort of external command and control application uh, like a mobile app or a human machine interface and so forth. And that actually covers a giant range of devices, everything from uh, small you know, Fitbits or something like that to a, a battleship. And our, actually, our, our, our IoT research director has come to hate the term Internet of Things because it's not specific enough. But it's in his title, so it haunts him forever. Um, and for policymakers, this definitional problem, this definitional problem of IoT is a real issue for them because in policy, with, with legislation or regulation, everything will end up getting litigated. Uh, companies want to know exactly what is required of them. And for a definition that ends up encompassing everything from you know, your mobile phone to a, you know, a, 
a connected car, uh, it, is, it is viewed as too broad and it lends itself to a lack of clarity. Um, we find this lack of clarity among uh, consumers and businesses as well. I mean, if your printer is connected to Wi-Fi, well, guess what? It is, in fact, IoT. Uh, so the definitional issue is a really difficult one, and we have found that uh, you know, one reason that people uh, don't tend to think of it as a traditional computer is because it doesn't have a keyboard and a screen. It's just it's a different form factor from what we are used to. Um, but IoT it, it's, uh, uh, it encompasses a, this giant range of devices. So one way that you'll see policymakers, and we'll talk about this a little bit more later, uh, start to look at uh, how IoT should be uh, protected, uh, regulated, or voluntarily um, is pretty sector specific. Um, you know, so it'll be medical devices and just IoT as it relates to medical devices or just connected cars and so forth. And so from our perspective, we think, um, and from our, I mean Access Now, not our, um, from uh, Access Now's perspective, we think that ultimately some of these differentiations in form may not be um, as meaningful in the long run. And when we talk about protections, um, looking at necessary security protocols um, or processes, necessary protections for the collection of data, that should be um, tech agnostic and not necessarily delve into which of these devices um, is collecting the information. So what does all this mean? Um, we talk about Internet of Things, as Harley said, because it brings in a lot of new things. Um, but these are rules. When we really, the, the Internet of Things and the conversations that, they, that that is bringing up, that that increase in the Internet of Things product is bringing up, those conversations should have been had a really, really long time ago. And the reason that we didn't is because they thought that they could, um, people in DC thought that they could just ignore the problem and it would go away. Um, they treated it like they treat a lot of other things where um, it will all be sorted out and there won't be serious problems with security or privacy and there hasn't been a major catastrophic security incident necessarily. Um, and so that means that we're doing okay. Uh, so we've let it go and let it go, and now as things have gotten more and more connected, we're reaching this kind of critical turning point where if we don't do something, we could see um, massive repercussions. And I think we already have, and we'll talk about that um, a little bit later when we talk about harm. Um, so we're going to talk today about um, common vulnerabilities, federal law and legislation, state data security and breach notification laws, and federal agency action. And this is a warning that there's going to be a lot of text on the slides ahead. I know people have really, really cute images, and I love slides that are really good. We want to make sure you have the information available um, on different citations to laws that you might want to take. So we're going to put that on the slides, and we apologize. Um, three major areas in the Internet of Things field. Privacy, security, and connectivity. Um, these are three issues. We're not going to touch upon all of them, actually. We're only going to look at the security aspects here today. But we wanted to flag that those two other areas um, bring a whole new realm of issues with them. Um, we're also not covering issues about liability, criminal law, law enforcement access to data, um, or data protection, which are separate, gigantic issues as well. When we talk about security, data that is or can be collected, control of the device itself. There are two different things that you want to secure. You want to secure the data, you want to secure the device. You want to go? Uh, sure. Uh, sorry. So um, we think of, of security as a uh, unauthorized system actions, right, as opposed to sometimes privacy. What we're talking about there are authorized system actions. And you, we, can, we look at IoT harms, the harms that can result from lack of security on a spectrum. So, so from greatest to, uh, to least, uh, uh, mass injury or loss of life, individual injury or loss of life, damage to critical infrastructure, damage to property and breach of sensitive information. That spectrum is sort of where we, what we view is at stake with Internet of Things security, uh, depending on the situation and the device. And uh, next, please. Keep going. We're going to common vulnerabilities. 
this over. Right. So uh, here are some of the common vulnerabilities that our team finds with uh, Internet of Things devices. So one, uh, insufficient update practices. So IoT devices, unlike a lot of traditional computers, will often lack an update or upgrade path once the device leaves the manufacturer's warehouse. And without a patching capability, it then becomes difficult to correct the device's known vulnerabilities, especially at a large scale. And so we are facing this wave right now of devices, especially smaller devices, that are uh, unpatchable but also unsecure. And although we have some confidence that IoT devices will build in an update capability more commonly in the future, we still will have this wave of legacy devices installed that we will have to deal with. Uh, second, lack of transport security. So in our experience, IoT devices will often fail to use modern uh, cryptographic standards for data in transit, and that risks exposing user data as it uh, goes through the public internet or local area networks. Third, unencrypted storage. So IoT devices and related services will often store data uh, in unencrypted formats. And uh, so that is, that is if, both the <laughs> if data is both stored on the device but also uh, in the cloud. And third, mobile application access. A fourth, ah, it's not on there, sorry about that. Um, but mobile application access. So mobile applications are often used to control consumer IoT devices. And what we have found is that those mobile applications will frequently give greater access and control, or greater access to the, uh, to the mobile device than is necessary to control the IoT device. And then UART access. UART is Universal Asynchronous Receiver Transmitter Interfaces. Uh, these will often enable a physically close attacker. These lights are really bright in case you guys can't tell. Uh, it will enable a physically close attacker uh, using a serial cable connection uh, to access the device and uh, in ways that will bypass normal user authentication. And one of the things about UART access is that it typically enables root uh, level permission, which far exceeds what a normal user would need. Uh, backdoor accounts. Uh, so manufacturers will occasionally include a service uh, or default account, which is difficult or impossible to remove under normal uh, usage, especially for your average consumer. And these accounts will frequently use a default password or an easily guessable password, not just for one device, but for a whole class of the manufacturer's devices. And then lastly, lack of segmentation. And so this is when uh, different components of, the, of a device share the same memory or circuitry. And so that a flaw in one component will affect another component. So a great example are cars. Uh, if you are able to get into the infotainment system of a car, you should not be able to get into the mechanical functions of that car. It's, it's brake and, and speed. Um, but unfortunately, lack of segmentation does make that possible in many circumstances. So that is a, a short list of uh, common vulnerabilities that we see in IoT. So what exists now to deal with those? Um, at the federal level, there are a few different laws um, that are called data security laws, and you'll hear people talk about them, things like Graham leach bliley the Fair Credit Reporting Act, the FTC Act. These don't actually say much about security other than requiring some sort of reasonable security for sensitive information, um, which has been interpreted in different ways, particularly in the FTC Act, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, there are some state laws on security. Uh, the primary pieces um, of security that are security regulation that we see in state laws, um, data breach notification, which we'll also talk about in a little bit. Um, the Federal Trade Commission trying to respond to what the Federal Trade Commission can and cannot do, um, and there are pieces of the, um, I'm really bad at these slides advancing things, guys. I'm really sorry. <laughs> it has two things here, and I'm a one click above where you guys are. Um, so the Federal Trade Commission's authority or lack thereof, and then the regulations on the ground at the state level, so where they can provide um, some guidance to state regulatory agencies in order to have things done not at the statutory level but down at the agency level. So I'm going to talk a second about data, uh, state data security and data breach notification law. So as of now, 
all 50 states actually have a data breach notification law. Uh, the last being Alabama, most recently, Alabama and South this Dakota. This year, right? That's right, this year. Uh, so we have reached patchwork supreme. Uh, all 50 states and the District of Columbia and some of the territories, uh, so Puerto Rico has, has a, a data breach notification law also. And these laws, I think part of the, part of the, the calculus is that breach notification is more politically uh, expedient than directly regulating data security. And I think that the idea originally was in part not just transparency for consumers, but also that uh, the, the cost and hassle of notifying consumers in the event of a breach would then inspire uh, holders of personal data to build in security at the front end so that the breach doesn't happen. And that calculus is not really working, right? The, the steady drumbeat of breaches is, is showing that. Um, it's too complicated. And so states are actually now starting to move in the direction of directly regulating uh, personal data security. There are 17 states, uh, as of my last count, that have uh, data security regulations in place. Um, usually they share some definitions with breach notifications, so the definition of personal information uh, is usually the same. And there are differences among the states. Um, there's no consistent standard, and so uh, consumers will receive uneven levels of protection based on where the data is being held, you know, or where the consumer is geographically. And this uneven level of protection also makes it difficult for businesses of all sizes to comply with. And so that, in, in our view, uh, hampers good security. Mm -hmm. um, now, those differences aside, the laws do follow some consistent patterns also. So uh, for speaking just for data security laws, um, usually the requirement is a reasonable level of security, and that's the word that they use, reasonable level of security, depending on the size and scope of the business and the sensitivity of the data. We think that that is a good thing, actually, that we think you know a, a gigantic corporation should be held to a different standard than a small pizza shop. Um, it, it enables companies and other holders of data to act based on the risks, you know, based on the sensitivity of the information and so forth. But where it starts to fall down and where it becomes a bit less useful for consumers and for IoT will often be in the definition of personal information. So personal information uh, for most of these laws uh, is stuff like your government ID numbers, so social security numbers, um, account credentials, your address, sometimes biometrics, sometimes health information that's not already covered by HIPAA, um, but also this anachronistic name requirement. Many of the states require that your name, your actual name, your first and last name or your first initial and last name be attached to the data, otherwise it does not actually qualify as personal data. So what that means is a, uh, a company could have your uh, social security number, your account credentials, you know, possibly even your biometrics, but unless, unless your name is also in there, then it's, it doesn't meet the definition of personal information and it's exempt from the regulation that requires reasonable security. A second thing about this that is anachronistic is when I talk about account credentials, uh, many, but not all, uh, states are limiting that uh, account credential requirement to accounts for uh, financial transactions. So here we're talking about your bank login, right, or you know your, your PayPal login. So it's accounts necessary to complete a financial transaction that is different from your personal media accounts, it's different from your online dating profile, it's different from the account that may be embedded inside your IoT device. And so, so you can see how this starts to become far and far, far, further and further removed from consumers' expectations for security with their devices and with their personal information. Um, I, I think that this is an example of the law sort of fighting the battles of the last century, really. They're fighting against identity theft uh, when companies and consumers are now facing a lot more, uh, a greater diversity of risks and harms uh, based on cybersecurity. I will call out four states briefly as uh, being exceptional in avoiding both of these problems, and that is California, Florida, uh, Maryland, and Minnesota. They do not have the real name requirement, and they do not limit uh, the account credentials merely to financial accounts. And I just want to quickly provide um, a, a, a way to think about what Harley is saying about personal data and definitions of sensitive data. Um, I assume that everybody, I cannot see you if you raise your hand, so I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand because I can't see any of you. Um, but how, I assume that most of you have a credit card um, or some sort of bank account number. 
if that number got lost or breached um, and was revealed to the public, think about just for a second if you would know how to respond. Um, if you kind of have in your mind a thought about how to cancel your credit card number, cancel any you know recurring payments to that card, get a new credit card, and you know how to mitigate the harm coming off of that. Now, if you think about the types of information that Internet of Things devices are going to collect about you, um, things like the number of commands that you give to um, Alexa, your physical activity, um, your location and where you are at any given time. I would imagine that the same number of you who know how to mitigate the loss of a credit card number don't necessarily know how to mitigate the loss of other more sensitive information that could be um, revealed into a database. And we haven't done a lot of research into how to mitigate that type of sensitive personal information, um, which means that if we were to create a system that somehow um, incentivized companies to do some of that research because they were going to have to notify people on the back end, we might be able to walk down a path where we were looking into that type, those type of harms, those type of non-financial harms, and mitigating those for people in a way that we can't even imagine um, that they can be mitigated today. So I want to talk a bit about the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC. Um, DC really, really loves acronyms. This is one of them that we use all the time. Nobody um, says Federal Trade Commission out loud. There's a lot of syllables there. Um, the FTC has the authority to go after companies who engage in two different types of trade practices. Um, trade practices that are deceptive, that's um, pretty clear on its face. If you say something and you do something else, you have engaged in a deceptive trade practice. And uh, easily the bulk of the FTC's um, actions in the privacy and security space were based on this deceptive prong of their jurisdiction. Um, but they have a second prong, and that's unfairness. Uh, unfairness, it means that it's likely to cause substantial injury to consumers, that's not reasonably avoided, and not outweighed by countervailing benefits. Additionally, there was a case that was decided in the 11th Circuit this year um, that adds a, a form of requirement, but kind of re-ups, that in addition to causing injury, the act has to offend public policy as set out in some sort of statute or judicial decision or the Constitution. Um, this is a additional element that people don't necessarily know how they're going to grapple with just yet. Um, because when you look back at reasonable security practices, um, there's not a clear statute to set out what that means. Um, and there's not a clear judicial decision that says what is a reasonable security practice. And so there's a little bit of uncertainty right now about how elevating that prong into a necessary prerequisite um, for the FTC to go after companies um, is going to play out in the long run. And I'm going to talk about that case and why um, some of that uncertainty exists. Um, but there are four main cases in the in the unfairness world. Um, so the FTC has kind of started feeling out its ability to go after companies for bad security practices under its unfair jurisdiction. Um, starting in 2005, BJ's Wholesale Club. Has anybody ever shopped at BJ's Wholesale Club? Do you know it? No? Yeah. I, I heard a yes. Thank you for, ver for verbally affirming what I'm saying. <laughs> Um, so the FTC here, they began to argue that unreasonable data security measures are unfair regardless of any public representation about a company's security practices. So they were, they were leaving behind their deceptive jurisdiction. They were saying you don't have to say what you have done and then lied. If you do something that offends basic data security, we're going to call that an unfair trade practice and we're going to be able to... Um, uh, start an investigation and, and potentially lead to a consent decree. Um, skipping ahead, 2014, you know, during that time, they, they continued to feel out their ability to use this. In the TrendNet case, this is a case that involved insecure um, home security cameras and baby monitors. The company transmitted user login credentials in clear text um, 
on users' mobile devices. And they failed to test, um, so the FTC found that they failed to test consumers' privacy settings to ensure that the video feeds marked as private would actually be private because these credentials were out in the open. Um, the company and the FTC ended up consenting to um, that the company had to implement a comprehensive data security program for at least 20 years. This is a requirement that the FTC puts upon companies frequently. In the privacy space, you see it often. You have to enter in a comprehensive privacy program for 20 years. Facebook is under a consent decree like that. Google is under a consent decree like that. So you see them starting in the, in the security space to say, OK, what happened in the privacy space, we're going to transfer over to security and require these comprehensive data security programs for 20 years. The company can figure out what that means, but they're going to have to enter into one. And this has been a key. Um, reason why some of the FTC's jurisdiction is called into question. Um, 2015, we saw the resolution of the Wyndham case. Wyndham, um, the hotel chain, had three intrusions into its networks between 2008 and 2010. The FTC said this was also um, that their failure to protect their networks meant that they were engaging in an unfair trade practice in regard to security. Um, and Wyndham challenged that. Wyndham said they did not have the authority to um, go after the company for these sorts of lax security measures. Um, and the FTC won. So Wyndham lost that case. The FTC's authority to use its secure or use its unfair authority to go after bad security was preserved until this year. And now we have some interesting questions. So the Lab MD case, Lab MD does not exist as a company anymore. Um, it was a company that screened people for cancer. And at some point, facts of the case, a company at Lab, or employee at LabMD downloaded LimeWire onto their computer. Um, the LimeWire, the files that LimeWire was able to access included a file that had sensitive personal information for LabMD's consumer base. And so it uploaded it into this peer-to-peer -peer serving and allowed it to be downloaded by anybody who was linking over to um, that user's computer. Um, the FTC, uh, LabMD notified people when they found out a security researcher luckily found the file and sent it back and said, FYI, you're User information is all on the internet. Um, they notified the FTC, and the FTC said, this is an unfair tr trade practice, um, and entered into one of these, or put forth one of these consent decrees um, with them, and LabMD challenged it. Um, LabMD continued to challenge it after the company no longer existed. They found the ability of the FTC to go after the company um, very offensive, and so they kept on challenging um, the FTC's authority here. And they challenged it straight up to the 11th Circuit. And the 11th Circuit just released its opinion, in this case, two months ago, um, I want to say, a month and a half ago. And what the 11th Circuit said is really interesting here. They said that, yes, LabMD engaged in an unfair trade practice. And they kind of said this without really deciding. And so this goes back to the need to tie it to a public policy or statutory requirement. Um, rather than really delving in and saying that that statutory or that policy requirement existed, they just assumed it did. Um, and this was the court saying, we don't need to make this determination right now because you're going to fail on the next part of this test that we throw at you. And they thought that they were really um, holding on a very narrow ground. But the ground that they held on was that requiring a information security program was too ambiguous of a requirement. It didn't provide an exact thing that LabMD had to do, and so it wasn't acceptable. It couldn't stand as a remedy, because it didn't necessarily specifically remedy the problem at fault, which the court said could have been something like, don't allow people to download LimeWire on their computers anymore. Um, so what inadvertently the court, was, court did in trying to have a narrow holding is really push the FTC into this world where now when they enter in these consent decrees, rather than having a um, requirement that could be evaluated, 
determine based on the secure the sensitivity of the data that the company could really figure out. Now the FTC has to be super prescriptive and has to make very specific requirements for companies that may be too arduous in some cases, that may be too bureaucratic, that might not actually solve any of the problems, but it's going to require the FTC to have a lot more detail in any future consent decrees with companies who engage in bad trade practices. So this is a really um, a live issue right now. I imagine that that is going to, um, they're still deciding if they're going to challenge it up um, or if they're going to try to seek further review of this case, um, but it's uh, actively changing area where the FTC is allowed to act. Oh, that wasn't. So we're going to talk a little bit about why, why do we even care about all of this? Why does it matter? Um, bad security in the IoT world can, can wreak havoc all over the world. And in fact, it, it has. Um, the Mirai botnet, which used to kick the most visited websites offline around the US, and incurred super high costs for a lot of people, um, was made up of a botnet of infected IoT devices. Um, the impact can be heavily felt in areas like children's toys. This is the Kayla doll that Germany banned because it was collecting, it said, too much sensitive information about children. Um, to sex toys, uh, Access Now actually filed an FTC complaint against a sex toy manufacturer last year because it was collecting um, information and transmitting it insecurely. The manufacturer of the sex toy you see on your screen was fined $4 million for collecting way too much data. Um, they said that they were collecting more data than they needed to, and the possibility for these type of devices to be hacked and controlled remotely um, outside, you know, we said harms or threats to the data, threats to the device, hacked and controlled remotely implicates an entirely different problem with security. We're already seeing um, IoT devices hacked, cars, guns, planes, um, as things get devices. Um, connected, they're having real world impact with their insecurity. And essentially, this is a market failure. This, would, that, would you say that, Harley? Market failure? I think that there is a wide recognition that market incentives are not aligned to actually promote IoT security, especially in low, uh, uh, low grade products that have a very small profit margin. Um, security is difficult to build in and maintain over time. It's not something that you can just do once and then ignore. And, uh, and it, is, uh, it is increasingly apparent to regulators, as well as folks that are watching this space, uh, that the amount of devices that are coming through that are not secure are not commensurate with the market forces that are pushing them to be secure. Um, I don't, I'm not sure that we're at the point where we know exactly what to do about yet, uh, about that yet. That is uh, part of the discussion that we're talking about here. That's it's a, a very live and ongoing conversation. Um, but there, uh, I think we're reaching a point where folks are questioning whether uh, the voluntary nature of uh, many uh, efforts to try to get IoT secure, whether or not that is actually working, and whether consumers are not uh, uh, too exposed. So in Congress, there are, we'll talk about two different laws just briefly. Um, one is the Internet of Things Cybersecurity Improvement Act. Um, this is a requirement for certification on some level um, of security and updatability for devices contracted for by the US government. So devices that the US government um, procures or uh, rents in some way have to meet some basic level of security and updatability. Um, it also has provisions to protect security researchers who act in quote unquote in good faith um, that would do a lot in the security researcher space um, in relation to IoT, but we think probably not enough. Um, it's definitely not a perfect pr proposal, um, but it goes a lot further than what we have today. Um, some of the vague definitions though, I think it fails where Harley talked about earlier um, where it applies to everything. Everything from like the teeny tiniest connected device all the way through um, your gigantic desktop computer that sits on your 
on your desk at home. We, we, we think that this is actually, the, the concept behind this bill is a very good one. Mm -hmm. um, focusing on federal procurement, focusing on the government's own purchasing dollars is one way to sort of short circuit the traditional opposition that comes when government tries to directly, directly regulate the private sector. Um, we hear very often that it's, well, government should clean its own house before telling the private sector what to do, and that's what this bill would be aimed at doing. But as Amy said, it did run into immediate trouble with the definition of IoT, because the definition that they used, which is actually an accurate definition, um, but in, in, you know, it's a physical object with internet connectivity, but that encompasses every phone, every laptop, every battleship, you know, every, every, every tank now. And, uh, and it became too unwieldy. And so the conversation became, how do they scale scale back that, that, uh, that broadness so that it actually becomes practicable. Um, but that's, that's sort of where the bill is now. Mm -hmm. um, a second proposal is the Cyber Shield Act. Um, this has been in part uh, proposed by Representative Liu, and it creates a new body in the government uh, that will implement or decide on minimum security standards. And if companies, IoT companies, meet those minimum security standards, they'll get some sort of seal that they can put on their packaging or on their product or whatever they box their, you know, connected car comes in and say that they have met the requirements um, on security. And so that is another proposal in Congress right now. Um, neither of them have gotten very far. Is it, that safe to say? It is. Uh, the the Cyber Shield uh, sort of envisions like an Energy Star style scheme for for security, and although there are uh, other certifications and uh, standards that are that are out there, there's actually a ton of standards that are out there for uh, for security. This would be the first one that uh, that is is, is uh, run or at least facilitated by the federal government. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the way that they had set it up, it's not the federal government sort of deciding the standards. It would be an open process with uh, in collaboration with experts and the private industry. Um, and on balance, we think that it's actually it's a good idea. It's worthwhile having the Energy Star program program is a big success, um, but that too, as Amy said, has, has run into, uh, in, into opposition. So Amy covered uh, uh, the Federal Trade Commission and sort of what's happening there in courts, right, so litigation. We talked about some of the state uh, uh, laws, and Amy just covered uh, Congress, uh, so f federal legislation. Um, but there is this other giant part of government, which is executive agencies. And so it's a, it, is, it is worth looking at what these executive agencies are doing about IoT security. And so behold, this is, this is the great wheel of federal agency action, the great wheel of acronyms. And so NIST, uh, NIST. The National Institute for Standards and Technologies. Right, in the Department of Commerce. So th this is possibly the most important, though least exciting, uh, of, of agencies. Uh, when it comes to this issue. Uh, NIST has, is actually very focused on IoT security. They have an IoT security program. They have 30 plus work streams that have some relation to IoT security. Many of these work streams are standards of various kinds, technical standards, which is sort of their bread and butter, but they're very in-depth, comprehensive, very technical. Um, but they are also uh, pursuing additional initiatives, and I'll just talk about two of those. But remember, there are uh, you know, some, some 30 of them. Um, one of them, which was just recently announced, just in the past couple months, is an initiative on lightweight cryptography. So the idea is to have uh, decently strong cryptography that can be used in devices that don't necessarily have a great deal of processing power. Uh, so that initiative is kicking off shortly. Uh, there's also a, uh, an, an initiative on managing IoT privacy and security risks, which is uh, very fresh. They actually just recently had a workshop on it. This is, this is last week. Um, and uh, it is uh, right now directed towards federal agencies, so it would be how federal agencies manage IoT security and privacy. Um, but in, in our experience in the past, many of, these, uh, many of these types of documents that are aimed at federal agencies can easily be applied to the private sector as well. And sometimes they become popular enough uh, with the private sector that they, they, they effectively, even though it's supposed to be for federal agencies, uh, it ends up being for both uh, federal and private sector. Um, but the, this, uh, this document of managing IoT privacy and security risks includes a lot of the stuff that you would want to see. It's talked about supply chain updates, device identification, uh, organizational and device mitigations, 
Um, so it is, it is relatively comprehensive, and it's in draft form, so it's ongoing right now, and there's an opportunity to participate in that if, so you, if you should so choose. Next acronym, please. So the Food and Drug Administration, FDA, uh, have actually been somewhat pioneers in this, uh, in this space. Um, they, uh, some time ago, had said that uh, they wanted to see their medical devices safe. That's, that's their original mandate, but that safety includes cybersecurity. And uh, as, so that, that part is mandatory, the, the, the devices must be secure, but they've also released uh, post-market guidance for medical device cybersecurity, which is not mandatory, it's quasi-mandatory, but it says to reach that mandatory goal of, of uh, security, cybersecurity, here is what we recommend, here is what we would do. And uh, as with the, the NIST documents I referenced, it's relatively comprehensive. And one of the things that it says, for example, is uh, it has a, a graph of uh, uh, risks that are severe and likely likelihood of uh, exploitation. And if you reach a certain point in that in that matrix, then you must issue a recall or issue an update. Uh, it also has, uh, refreshingly, a uh, coordinated vulnerability uh, process requirement so that uh, if, uh, uh, if researchers come to a company with a vulnerability, the company is supposed to act on it and so forth. Um, so that is, that is already out there. Next, please. So this is the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. This, this is my is, favorite acronym in DC. Is it NHTSA? It is. I, my personal favorite is probably still PATRIOT. Probably still Patriot because I just thought that was wow. What a so it took some creativity. There is there are some very skilled acronym makers in in DC. Um, so NHTSA. So this is part of the Department of Transportation, and unsurprisingly, they they run uh, traffic safety, um, and they have made clear that their existing authorities on in terms of the safety of vehicles also encompasses cybersecurity, uh, and they have exercised that authority. So for example, they uh, were behind a recall of 1.5 million Jeep and Chrysler vehicles after the infamous. Uh, Charlie Miller, uh, uh, Chris Valisic uh, hack uh, uh, of a Jeep. So they didn't need new authority to do that, and uh, and they, they were recalled over a cybersecurity safety issue. Um, in addition to them exploring what their existing authorities enable them to do, uh, they have also issued voluntary guidance uh, for car manufacturers that goes into some depth about uh, car security. Uh, so defense in depth, you know, a risk assessment, pen test, uh, segmentation, coordinated vulnerability disclosure, et cetera. Uh, this, as with uh, FDA, and you'll find this is a pretty common theme, is focused really just on safety, on physical safety. Uh, next, please. So the Consumer Product Safety Commission, uh, they recently held a hearing exploring how their existing authority covers consumer IoT. Uh, that too limited just to safety, uh, and they actually specifically stated in submitting comments and as part of their hearing, you know, please just focus on uh, on uh, the hazards, physical hazards that these devices can pose. And Amy, actually, you you had submitted comments to that hearing. You want to? We talk did. About that? We asked them to focus on the criminal law ap aspects. Um, Criminal law, specifically at the state level, but also at the federal level, does not necessarily anticipate, in a lot of cases, um, crimes that happen because of technology. And so we know arson is a thing. And if you set something on fire, it's arson. If you cause a toaster, toasters, um, to turn on and overheat and you set a house on fire, criminal laws don't necessarily anticipate that as being arson. And what we don't want to happen is for laws that are already over broadly um, interpreted and used to um, target computer researchers like the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act to be expanded unnecessarily in order to take care of crimes that should be dealt with by traditional criminal law. And so we've asked them to do a survey of criminal laws across the country and to see um, how criminal law needs to be adapted for crimes that can happen um, through IoT devices. That is an excellent point. I would just note, though, that the... Okay. All right. Um, that the, the Consumer Product Safety Commission is looking uh, also at the, the uh, straight regulation of uh, the design and manufacture of these devices as they relate to hazards. Uh, next, uh, so the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, uh, they came out with uh, an IoT green paper. It does cover IoT security and privacy, although not in tremendous depth, uh, but it talks about the f same familiar things, risk management, security by design, et cetera. Uh, next, please. 
the Department of Energy, uh, uh, FERC, actually the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, uh, is taking a more active look at how cybersecurity relates to electrical equipment. Um, this is IoT in a broad sense, so you know, large-scale electrical equipment that you would normally find in things like power plants. Uh, next. The Department of Homeland Security, they release strategic principles for securing the Internet of Things. Um, there, they uh, talked about uh, you know, basic uh, security steps that have been covered in the, in the other reports, um, but also a call to action for policymakers and legislators to use their existing authority to look at tort liability and to look at the possibility of new regulation. And then lastly, uh, the White House, working with NIST and the Department of Homeland Security on automated attacks and botnets. Now, this is from an executive order. Uh, interestingly, the executive order focused on automated attacks and botnets, but a great deal of the resulting report and work are actually focused on IoT. No doubt this is inspired by the Mirai botnet. Uh, and there, it talks also about calling on agencies to enforce their existing authority and calls on the community to disrupt attacks um, and it calls on manufacturers to make IoT uh, easier for consumers to use uh, more securely and calls on manufacturers to adopt all these voluntary standards that are out there. Next, please. So there's a big question um, in place about whether IoT uh, manufacturers and operators will actually abide by, will actually adopt all of these standards and all of these voluntary documents that, that are out there. There are many, many of them, as I hope the, that run through just demonstrated. Um, so if, and, and if they don't, then what happens? Are we looking at the possibility of new regulation, which itself is an arduous process? Um, but will, will buyers require adherence to these standards, and will users demand it? These are things that we should be really vigilant about. So we should be watching these voluntary programs and, and be very skeptical of calls for new voluntary programs or new voluntary standards. And at the moment that you hear somebody say, well, there should be an IoT security standard out there, well, there, there are. There, there's, there's at least a dozen, you know, 30 of them or so. Um, in addition, there are ways that we as consumers and we as uh, tech savvy people or we as security researchers are able to help. Uh, many of these standards are developed through an open process where anybody can show up and contribute. Um, even some of, the, uh, some of the reports that are not necessarily standards, you can contribute to them and, and offer your input. Um, there are also ways that you can vote with your wallet. UL and consumer reports are uh, at various stages of maturity and developing uh, certification for IoT uh, to give consumers better information about the security level of, the, of a given device. Um, the Consumer Reports one actually is also open so that people from the community can come and contribute and give their feedback. And then lastly, if you have uh, the, the skills to do it, um, there are legal ways, uh, perfectly legal ways, to actually examine the security of IoT. Uh, the, that last logo there is the Copyright Office. The Copyright Office has actually issued some pretty forward-looking uh, regulations uh, scaling back the uh, Section 1201 of the DMCA uh, prohibition on uh, on, on circumventing technological protection measures. This is, this is actually one major way that security researchers found themselves uh, in legal trouble. And they, they're, they're, they've actually put forth a means for researchers to conduct that kind of research while avoiding uh, that liability. As long as you're not breaking other laws and as long as you're doing it responsibly and solely for security as, as opposed to money, uh, then you, you are able to uh, look at uh, the security of IoT devices and bring it to the manufacturer with the goal, hopefully, of a positive resolution, like a patch and greater public transparency. And that is all that we've got in terms of content. <laughs> um, I think we thought that we had an extra 12 minutes, but apparently we don't. Two, if anybody has a burning question or we can answer them. Please outside. remember that we cannot see your hands if you raise it. Right here. Go to the mic. So it's on the tape. Here's the mic. No. I, I understand that there's a microphone and that's what we should be listening to. <laughs> Mike, uh, I understand this is not exactly your problem, but I just wanted to ask this because of the title of the talk and so on. So you have a large, uh, large networks like this with nodes that operate with varying rules and so on, uh, emergent behavior that can emerge in any kind of system like that. At what point, what number of Internet of, Internet of Things devices does it take before you start seeing nonlinear, non-mechanistic behavior 
um, consciousness, you know, self-awareness. And do those kind of phenomenon that could start rippling around, could that be an issue as well? I will meditate upon that on my plane ride home. I don't know the answer. <laughs> I'm sorry, I, but, I, but I think it, I think it probably depends a great deal on uh, on the type of devices, right? I mean, if they're all the, if they're all the same device, that consciousness is extremely limited. If you have devices that focus on a bunch of different aspects of reality, then you start to approach the singularity, maybe in a in a uh, you know by a small degree. Uh, next question. So I was thinking about the statement of how do we get people to care about the security of all these IoT devices. And you mentioned consumer reports and like their rating system. And I wondered how could we get people to care about that like the IAHS did in the 90s with car safety? Because I feel like that wasn't as much in the public eye. They really made a big deal of it. And then now it, I, I, it seems the manufacturers responded that, oh, we have to do good on this test. A little bit of this, I think, is it is, and this will be the last question, is going to be um, protecting vulnerable populations. When you had car safety regulations put into place, things like seat belts, um, they were to make sure that even like the cheapest vehicles that were out there were providing a level of security that was necessary. Um, in the IoT space, a lot of times when you talk about regulation, you hear innovation, you're going to kill innovation with regulation. What we really want to do is make sure that even the products that are being purchased by the lower socioeconomic classes are providing a baseline minimum of security um, that other people are going to be able to afford by virtue of being able to afford things. Um, and that is a, one of the big things to get to. And I would just very quickly point out, I think we had automobiles for some 150 years before we had seatbelts. And we are still at the very, very much at the knee of the curve of, of what IoT is, is going to do. And, but we had uh, horrible car accidents for a very, very long time before safety standards were really put into place and saved so many lives. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody.